when we're good. It'll be good. Yes, so just like that introduction states, um, I'm Jessica Davidson, um, history major here, um, also with a public history and museum studies minor. Awesome. Um, and today I am presenting maternal cycles, pregnancy in early America. Uh, which quite the topic, but the more I got into it and hopefully the more um, that you all get into it uh, today, we'll all find very interesting. But first, as a little disclaimer, <laughs> I started researching this uh, before the summer of 2022 and therefore did not include any court rulings that occurred over that summer. And as a historical presentation, I will not be covering um, any of the more modern turns that our nation has taken in such time. Um, but at the end of this pre presentation, perhaps I will be persuaded to answer some questions, um, <laughs> is the goal. But in such time, we will stick to uh, the loosely bound barriers of early America, but also expanding those because sources on pregnancy uh, can be a little hard, so I might have stretched the edge of what is considered early America in a good way, though, in a good way. It's all for the sources. So I did kind of want to start off with what got me interested in pregnancy. Um, and kind of a more famous quote is Laurel Thatcher, Thatcher Ulrich's uh, Well Behaved Women Seldom Made History. But I had never known that quotation in its actual context that it was written, not that you should be really loud and like make history and like go against the man, man. Um, <laughs> even though those are all very good things, that still precludes a lot of women through history that have gone about their lives and done what society has asked of them. Um, and therefore, we know little about women's history, which is a problem. Um, and even among the history of um, women and reproduction and having babies, the most important part in literature and even during uh, medical records during early America and before, uh, has been the actual birth part, the part where you get a baby out of it, you know, that exciting part. <laughs> um, but there's nine months that goes to that before any of that ever happens. So what's up with that? Um, so that kind of got me on the journey of like, huh, that's a lot of time to exclude from a process that is actually quite small in comparison, even if it is the more dramatic and traumatic part of the whole process. Um, so, and it also kind of goes into this larger aspect of, and like a preface of a lot of times uh, we try and like put more modern ideas on people who lived in the past, even though that is not the way that they themselves would have thought of the process that they were going through. Um, and a lot of times we think of pregnancy as a single event, one circle starting, you're pregnant, and then you give birth, and that's the end, and that's your little circle of a single pregnancy, and you talk about it as a singular sort of event, when more largely in the past, it would have likely acted or have been thought of as a chain of events that were connected to one another with one pregnancy being a single link in the chain connected by either breastfeeding or sometimes uh, infant death, of course, is very common as we'll go over in this presentation, creating this link in the chain of several children in a family that a mother would have whether they survive or not, all being an event until it ends with menopause, her no longer having children, or the unfortunate but still relatively uncommon event of a woman's death. So to kind of get into that and also 
a little historical background of at least where I'm coming from as a uh, researcher in this whole event so you can follow along with the path that I tra uh, traced through this journey. Um, it is Nora Doyle who wrote the spectacular book, Maternal Bodies, Redefining Motherhood in Early America, and kind of the relation of not only pregnancy, but also women uh, in general, and how they navigated their space in that time um, as a female, and sort of how they saw themselves in society, but also more commonly how society uh, impressed its will upon them. Uh, but her book doesn't only focus on pregnancy, she goes um, a lot beyond that. Um, kind of the same theme with Laura Friedenfeld's The Myth of the Perfect Pregnancy, A History of Miscarriage in America. So kind of dispelling that idea of you become pregnant and it's this wonderful idea, but we like to exclude the idea from our mind that other outcomes are possible in that scenario. Um, but she takes that a lot farther and even brings it into much more modern times, um, which was largely excluded from my thesis statement, trying to stick within the boundaries of early America, uh, but still really interesting and kind of uh, reframes the idea of how we view viewed and continue to view uh, pregnancies and expectant mothers. Um, and then the last one was one of my favorites, and I learned a lot from her, is Jennifer L. Morgan and her book, Laboring Women, Reproduction and Gender in the World of Slavery, um, deals a lot with, obviously, non-white women, um, which, of course, have been historically precluded from a lot of these discussions about motherhood and pregnancy. Uh, but she goes well beyond um, America and goes a lot into um, Caribbean and sort of um, like Central and even South America plantations. Um, and I did sort of include some of those just because um, you have to widen the net a little bit when sources tend to thin themselves out, if you will. But with all that background, by the way, uh, we can sort of get into maternal cycles, which actually does not start with any of the cycles. It starts with the very clear acknowledgement that not all women have or are capable of having children um, and are thus childless women. Um, and we see this idea in the word mother uh, was important title in society, uh, almost like a secondary title after you became married and your new name being Mrs. Smith or whatever, um, almost wasn't fully intact or fully granted by society until you had your first child and were an officially a mother of the community and brought into this matronly club of mothers who had children, in a sense. Which leads to an interesting comparison of self-worth and a sense of purpose being explicitly equated um, to a woman's childbearing potential, uh, which the consequences of this could vary largely in depending of your social status. Uh, if you were a free woman of any standing, either, either upper class, middle, or the large majority of lower class women, um, it was societal ridicule. You were a half woman, you were a barren woman, and were therefore not fully part of society as you had not fulfilled the one role that society had given you. And there wasn't necessarily other avenues of success that men could go through if they didn't have children in their lifetime. They could still be a successful businessman and not have children and still be successful. While 
There are cases of women who didn't have children who were somewhat successful. A lot of those cases are far less than the actual number who would have faced that ridicule and stigma of you had failed in some way. Um, on the flip side of that, then you have the enslaved population in America, and those have drastically different consequences. You could be sold from the current area that you were living at if it was believed to be an issue from your partner, even though enslaved people were not allowed to be married in a sense, you still had partnerships between people and you could be ripped away from that if that partnership had been deemed unfruitful. Um, but also either being sold or being the target of predatory rape and assault if a individual slave owner decided he wanted to do that but didn't necessarily want children out of that coupling, it becomes a tempting target that an enslaved woman couldn't have really done anything about. Um, so with childless women, we finally like, get into the actual cycle um, of the maternal, <laughs> the, uh, maternal cycles is planning and pregnancy, which still has not gotten in to the actual pregnancy itself. It's a weird chain we're building here. Um, so kind of starting off uh, with prevention, you see this almost like regaining of control a lot by um, enslaved women of either consciously choosing not to have children and abstain from all sexual acts, um, or there have been several accounts of like chewing cotton root, um, which had varying effects. A lot of um, science says that it promotes oxytocin in the bottom body, which then um, promotes like regular cycles, the same thing as like what the hormonal pill does, um, but a lot less certain and you're kind of rolling the dice with that one, but it's still this measure of rebellion, of taking back choice in a situation that didn't have choice for you. But of course, usually the only real way of preventing pregnancy uh, is abstinence. But even then, a lot of that didn't necessarily have choice in it as um, marital rape wasn't part of the court system and wasn't legally acknowledged, um, which means your husband um, could become sexually intimate with you at any time and you couldn't legally say no because you were married. So despite a lot of um, like letters between sisters or mothers claiming that they no longer wanted any more children, a lot of those women still had more children after those letters. Um, and it's hard to tell whether that was their choice, um, but it's still something to keep in mind. But the actual planning or spacing of pregnancy is also very important um, with the natural knowledge and reminder of breastfeeding as a known use to plan and space out your pregnancies, not that you didn't want any more, but you didn't want them so close. Um, a lot of times you like read encouragements from mother-in-laws especially, uh, oh, well, if you nurse this one child for about two more years, then you'll maybe hit menopause and you won't have any more children. So like good luck nursing for two more years, which of course is easier said than done, but you're still trying your best um, to space that process out. Um, although again, breastfeeding wasn't always something that you had all of the control over for yourself, especially for enslaved women uh, being allowed to breastfeed your, your child uh, at certain times of the day and not an actual regular reoccurring feeding schedule that an infant would need 
to become healthy, grow, um, which also had some pretty nasty effects if you don't regularly breastfeed. Um, it can kind of undermine your breast milk supply and that starts to run out. It can cause abscesses and damages of the nipples and kind of this cracking and burning, um, but also increased mal malnutrition in kids and increased infant death, which is always more common amongst enslaved children. The signs of pregnancy, I always thought this was really interesting as kind of like the official beginning of the maternal cycle of the idea of maybe having become pregnant, but not quite being sure because they didn't have the ability to take an at-home kit as you pee on a stick and wonder if two lives were gonna appear. Um, so, and it was a lot more than just having a late period. In fact, missing a period uh, can be caused by any number of things, uh, stress, worry, overwork, or a lot of times it was common for newlywed brides uh, to have moved for the very first time in their life. You stay in this one house for your whole life with your family, and all of a sudden you get married and for the first time after you become sexually active and you have this big move and your period misses. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been told about. It's happening. Um, and then it comes again the next month because we're stressed out or we're a um, First pregnancy was always kind of the longest to confirm as you had no experience as to what to expect. Uh, but a lot of emphasis is put on the quickening or the first kick of the baby in the womb as being A, like a for sure sign that you are pregnant but also a kind of self-allowance to become attached to your pregnancy, which we'll kind of touch on a little later as they were not attached as attached to their own pregnancies for good and apparent reason. Um, the toll pregnancies took on bodies were again, kind of varied and um, I don't want to say they had a fatalistic view, but more a realistic understanding of the potential outcomes um, for a pregnancy that wasn't always a healthy baby at the end of it. Um, also being understood as a dangerous undertaking um, not only for yourself, but for your child and kind of having that worry. Um, but looking back, we are probably much more worried for them than they would have been for themselves. Um, if you had children for that long um, of a period of time, continually throughout all of your adult life, uh, then more of your pregnancies would have been what we have considered to be high risk today. Uh, 35 around that, some uh, doctors kind of debate what age uh, high risk pregnancies happen. I believe it's like been raised in recent years and it's around 35. But if you're 35 in early America, you're probably still having two to three more children, which means those last few pregnancies would have been high risk in terms of our judgment today. Um, but you'd also be sort of included unofficially until you had the child, this maternal club and community coming together of a new baby. Um, but also kind of on the flip side, having all of the town's eyes on you meant a social pressure to do certain things during your pregnancy. Uh, specifically in later months of pregnancy, doing things like not leaving the house because your belly is showing too much. And that means you've had sex. Um, scandalous. <laughs> um, and one of the letters that I included in this, I thought was really interesting um, and it's from 
Matilda Henry as a letter to a, a friend. Uh, and she states that I went to church till I heard of people laughing, and now I stay home altogether, as she was in sort of her later months of pregnancy. Um, and a lot of what little we have shows that women were not pleased with that sort of social pressure, but more often than not found themselves bending to it. Um, of course, with pregnancy comes health risks of pregnancy um, and kind of leads into very dangerous waters of ideas of pain tolerance and race um, and ideas that Black women and women of color uh, either felt no pain, as some doctors believed at the time, or at least felt less pain and were therefore more suited to the practice of giving birth, also leading to horrific medical experiments done on them and for the sake of gyne gynecological research. Uh, and a lot of what we know today about women's reproductive system, the way we learned that is quite horrific. Uh, and then on the adverse of that, um, white women equated to being civilized and having become civilized, you essentially lost your nature and it was more painful to give birth at least. Uh, working before and after pregnancy always increases somewhat health risks, but again, the vast majority of women didn't have a choice in order to work while pregnant, and that's not only including enslaved women, but also women of lower class who couldn't afford to not work while pregnant. Um, and then work after pregnancy, uh, some sources bury or some plantations and slave owners um, would set certain times that a woman would have off after she gave birth. Um, the highest I've seen is two weeks, more commonly under, but the lowest um, was three days, which is very fast turnaround. Um, and that kind of fast turnaround increases chance of infection. And at the time, if you were to die of something related to giving birth, infection or bleeding out was the most common. The language of pregnancy, I actually didn't know if I would include this in my final paper, but I read so much about it that I was really intrigued about uh, the lack of the word pregnancy as least. Um, as far as language pertaining to enslaved women um, who were pregnant largely revolves around profit and what kind of profit they would bring in um, to their owners or at auction houses, just them as females being perceived as how many children did one person or another think they could potentially have in the future meaning more profits. Um, and that essentially became more important with the banning of the slave trade, but still having internal slavery and really needing to fuel that internal market of trade. Um, but as far as other types of language, it's a lot of like alluding to languages. Like the quote here, it says, write me in your next letter uh, whether our suspicions as to your situation are correct. And that is um, one husband or another writing to his wife at home, hey, let me know if you think what we think is correct, but never saying the word pregnant, but just sort of dancing around the topic. Um, never saying pregnancy or never saying with child. They wouldn't even say that or scandalous. Um, you also see sort of like these shifts in language in earlier colonial times. Um, you had more references of words like teeny, flourishing, growing, kind of this more positive energy of 
a new life is being created. But in more early America, um, you get words like situation, predicament, or just sort of like having a complaint about a known pregnancy symptom, which sort of indicates a more negative turn of view of pregnancy um, in the latter half of the century and then turning into the 1800s, which we're not quite sure why the view turned negative, uh, but it did, and they weren't happy about it. Um, but then also discussing other potential outcomes, as we've mentioned before, pregnancy, is you don't always get a baby out of it. Um, you can, and this sort of understanding of alternative endings uh, was very understood. It was the reality you were faced with of being aware that at any time, for unknown reasons to you, you could have a miscarriage. Though they never called it that, it was an accident, a slip, mishap, or the most common term is just a miss. Um, this could also be medically dangerous as well. If the fetus who had died in utero did not fully dislodge itself, um, then it essentially starts to decay in the body um, and now becomes infectious and can be extremely lethal if not correctly dealt with. Um, it also ties into early modern medical theory and ideas of bodily flows that your body once attached to a certain trend, will continue to follow that. So say for example, um, you've had two children, but your third pregnancy, you miscarry around four to five months along. Um, then it would be believed that the next time you carry, you would also be more likely to have a miscarriage because your body has now got itself into an incorrect flow. Another one would be, um, no, that was the answer. I was gonna go in. Um, but that if the flow of the body had been like thrown out of whack or misentuned, then things could go wrong um, and needed to be fixed or corrected. We'll talk about on that on the next slide. But understood causes of miscarriage could be anywhere from worked too hard, you ate spicy food, um, or you had too much sex, which again wasn't always your choice. Um, but fairly pinned on the woman or mother herself as being caused by her, which sounds very shocking to us, but they would not have understood it as necessarily blame on them, but more of just they had a reason why it happened, or at least a rationalized why. Uh, but that also kind of brings the necessary idea of needing to reset that cycle, um, and usually calling bringing down the myths or causing your menstruation to happen um, with that being followed by sort of the visual confirmation of that with usually just appearing as regular menstrual blood with perhaps more tissue involved. Um, it was done for not only a variety of reasons, but was largely medically known and understood to be necessary and acceptable, even if it was, on most people's ideas, a sad outcome to that end. Um, the reason for doing it is sometimes social, but was largely, mostly for medical reasons. Um, not highly discussed, but again, it was never shunned or looked down upon as something that had been done wrong or like an evil that person had done, but a sad, necessary thing. 
that needed to be done. Um, and again, it goes back to that abiding by the idea of bodily flows. Um, the example I almost included last slide, but fits better with this slide, is that um, you have the baby and it dies soon after birth, like a month after birth. Infant death, infant mortality, also very high and understood as an unfortunate but reality of life. Um, then your milk production stops and you no longer lactate and you become pregnant again a month after giving birth. That now sets an extremely dangerous precedent and you will likely not carry that child to full term. But if you miscarry that child or miss it or whatever, slip, um, you have now set this dangerous precedent of your bodily flow. And it is now understood that bringing down the myths is necessary for not only your health, but to create a healthier future family. Uh, so that sort of like evacuation of that is necessary, but also uh, if a miscarriage had not fully um, dislodged itself and it is now infecting your body, uh, bringing down the myths, same medical herbs that you would have done that process is also necessary for that to sort of stimulate contractions to get the rest of it out of your body. Um, essentially to save the woman's life. If you didn't do that, you could die. Um, yeah, well, that was, but sort of that being the end of the cycle, at least, or the sort of continuation ending into the next cycle, and you can see it coming around, back around uh, with breast, breastfeeding, lactation, uh, into family planning, now back into the cycle, you can kind of see it go around, or at least um, why I, I ordered it in that manner. But it's, that is my stoa talk. Thank you all. Um, yeah. Yes, that was more vividly on the sense. Any um, questions or comments people had? For me, yes. What part of the material when you were doing the research did you find the most um, interesting or the most surprising? Um, probably the last two slides of like miscarriages or like bringing down the the meds or uh, like abortion is what we would call it now. Of uh, we kind of have ideas about how we think about it today and then we assume that's how like more oh the more concerned people back in early America totally would have thought about it in such and such way um when they didn't and they had their own ideas about not only how bodies functioned but how things should be handled in a way to promote a healthier woman slash healthier family. Yes. I was wondering what, if any, role did superstition play in maternal cycles? So for instance, your slide where you had the husband writing the wife talking about the thing is the thing true that we think is true, but we don't want to say what it is. Mm -hmm. Is that is that all have to do with sort of societal conventions of, of decency or does it have a little bit with superstition, I don't want to say why or separate. Nothing that I read implied that it was sort of this like don't jinx it mentality. It was largely like there's no proper English word to, to say this. Oh, uh, can't say pregnant with child is too scandalous. So it was a lot of this like odd roundabout talk and there's even a set of letters between a mother and her daughter and the mother 
is trying to like ask her to just say it flat out. She's like, I can't. And she's like, what is happening to you? You say you're sick, what is wrong with you? Just like tell me flat out that you're pregnant. Um, but she like the daughter will not, and it just keeps going back and forth in these letters and that she won't say it. Yes. So we when you were talking about um sort of the 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 gender roles and expectations with regard to women getting pregnant, um, the pressure from the men, pressure from society, what role do you think religion might have had in that in terms of you know sort of those old testament scriptures of be fruitful and multiply that there's sort of the commandment for women to procreate that's their sole responsibility yay jesus yeah. um what role do you think sort of religion in that time period would have um a fairly large but not exclusive portion of that pressure of kind of of like to be the good proper family religious not only going to church um man and wife having a good relationship but also just a slew of kids behind you but also a slight i didn't like add it in here but during this time period um american families had technically shrunk in comparison to a lot of their european or less like english counterparts um and that's not necessarily religion, but it's also sort of, uh, they tended to breastfeed their kids for a shorter period of time, which then now puts you back into the cycle of and chance, higher chance of becoming pregnant. Whereas um, in America, it had become increasingly more common and encouraged to breastfeed each of your children for as long as you could, like the one mother uh, encouraging her daughter to breastfeed for two years, which is a long time, uh, but encouraged to do so, so you can more space out for children. So they're technically having less kids, but they're still big families, at least by our standards today. Yeah. I'm curious to following up on this um, about we saw much of an age difference is one thing that we sort of assume from like late colonial into the early republic period family sizes and places mm -hmm. in the united states um in part so first basing in part because the average age of first marriage increases for women i'm just curious at least sort of thinking about change over time in your paper did you happen to note like the letters of like these women having their first babies go from being like 20 years old in like the beginning of this time period to like 25 26 for example which wouldn't have been unusual um by like the 1820s to be a little older in your first pregnancy i mean i i kind of noted that but that wasn't always necessarily what I was looking for what like my brain focused in on. Like once you kind of set your thesis statement, you kind of become like locked in. And I was like, are they talking about babies or not? If not, get that letter out. That's the explanatory photo. Yes. Sign up. Yeah, so, so you kind of mentioned like the maternal community and stuff that happened after you had your first child, um, but obviously they did have those societal pressures. Do you think that most women, like from the letters you read, do you think their views on pregnancy and that societal world changed after they had a baby, or do you think that they still mostly felt like other women should be dragged out of these places? Um, probably largely stayed the same because what you kind of have to keep in mind is that there was no like alternative thought of well, maybe I don't want to be a woman who has children or don't want to have any children of my own there wasn't like if I get married I'm only going to adopt uh because I don't want to like have a population increase like that wasn't the mindset they were going at it with it was sort of like you grew up you got married 
you became a mom and had kids and then those kids had kids and that was your life congratulations and that's not like oh that's so sad but it was just like their life and it's hard to kind of speculate um uh, whether like some women really like fought against that or other sort of accepted and enjoyed their role of motherhood just sort of like we do in modern times of yeah it's okay if you grow up and don't want to have kids but it's also okay too to grow up and say I do want to have children having those both be equally okay in antiquity it would have been a certain level of sort of selflessness for a woman to do that um, simply because if she did not produce children, she was a burden on some person, some man, generally speaking, um, in her life because she couldn't support herself. She couldn't go out on her own. She couldn't own a business. She couldn't do this. She couldn't do that. So the only value she had was as producing children. And so you get, at least in, in ancient um, texts, this, this notion that if, if she's not doing this, then she's a burden and she's costing the family money. Do you see any parallels in this period with that? Um, maybe not as heavily viewed as a burden as that would be, but it sort of goes back to that sort of idea of being labeled as barren and that you're this sort of like half woman who has not completed the only societal role that she's allowed to like inhabit and have. <laughs> Yeah, take what you're a half woman who's costing us money. <laughs> and well, it's here, you're school. gonna at least have to bring in other, like find some other like like maybe you're source. really good at the loom. And you just like make the best rugs. I don't know. But like you have a you may have a skill, but like you're still barren and have the societal score of like you still couldn't have children. That sucks for you. Well, yeah, even like, like, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, because you brought up Laurel Petrol already. You, I've made you read Midwife's Tales. <laughs> so, um, I just have her says, even if you have children, because Martha Ballard had children, but the balance was wrong mm -hmm. in terms of her male and female balance. So, it was, so even though, like, she'd done her thing of being a wife and mother, brought in actual cash as an adult, brought in additional economic resources that were not monetary um, as a midwife. <laughs> Right, but like, if you had all of your girls at like one end, and like they were not at the right age to help you with the weaving and the gardening, or if you had too many boys or too many girls, you could still have this like economic imbalance, imbalance that requires either if you're lucky having like nieces or nephews you can yank into the house, and if you're not, actually damaging your family income. So even if like even if you did your job, you could still be an economic burden because you had the wrong type of baby. It, well, this explains the new Arkansas law allowing for child labor. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I that kind of like went a little bit now outside of my original thesis of the whole point of like wanting to fo focus on pregnancy um, instead of like everything that happened after that because that study. People have done that. I know, since you, you looked at language a little bit, did you happen to kind of pick up on the sort of pejorative terms and things that they referred to and referred to women who did not fulfill a role? Like I'm thinking about phrases like the old maid, you know, old maids, um, some of the stuff, for example, that Jane Austen kind of got labeled um, because a freaking book writer, but clearly not a mom. So, but she was also a not married, I believe. So it was also this like marital status combined. So like if you were married, now you at least have the respectable title of Mrs. Um, but if you didn't additionally on top of that have children, then you were still like a weird half failure, if you will. Like you fulfilled half of society's job for you of getting married. Um, but you didn't do the other half, which is also important. So, like, negative five points for you. <laughs> Did they have specific phrases for that? Because you know when, like, the ones who aren't married about kids, it's you know, the old maids, spinsters, that kind of language. Was there a specific term? Or did they just say, you know, you're half a person? 
not outside of the word baron that I found. Like they, you would be called baron, like to your face. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Like, sorry, I know this is outside the paper, but like, <laughs> like fewer, in some ways, fewer opportunities, like being a, a married parent woman, to use their terminology, is almost worse in some of these communities than being a spinster or an old maid, because in some cases, like, it's not ideal, but like, if you're, if you're a married woman, you're still not expected to like, do something else, whereas like, you know, for us, like, you've got cases of, like, unmarried sisters starting a boarding school or something. Like, you can do that in 1810 if you're unmarried and yeah. have some financial backing from a brother or something, which is not a great, super stable position, but, like, you have some outlet and options. If you're married and barren, you're just, like, you, you can't pivot and say, like, yeah. I'll do something just, else with my extra you're time. Not, your legal rights change, change when you, you don't hang it. <laughs> um, so that you're in this, like, weird, awkward stage. Yeah, and were they often seen as, like, holding their husband back if they were barren? Like, was there any kind of context on how it was? Honestly, I don't know, and I didn't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> um... And also, like, the large part of my research and the reason I found it so interesting, um, like, was the last bit of cycle and kind of, like, the dangers of misses or how that was uh, not necessarily, like, put as blame, but it was just like, oh, yeah, that was sad. That didn't, that one didn't work out and she had, had to oddly be okay with that. So and that's yeah. why they didn't get attached. Yeah, I mean, and you didn't, and that was kind of okay if you weren't. Yeah. Stay, stay the question in a little bit of a different direction. So I thought you did a really job of outlining the different experiences and expectations that were in existence for enslaved women and and uh, white women. You, and this might be a topic of one of your secondary sources. Was there any discussion of uh, where Native American women fell into that spectrum? Were they even more as the uh, net barbaric age as enslaved women or part of that? Um, they so most that. likely would have been viewed in sort of that like barbaric, uncivilized vein, at least for like ideas of pain tolerance, mostly just because they weren't white. Um, as far as other sources, I couldn't really find a lot of other sources um, that talked about Native American women. So I sort of just had to content myself for the larger part of this essay and also the time in which I had to research this of enslaved women. And even that, finding myself casting a bigger net in a longer time period um, than a lot of my other um, white sources, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I know you mentioned that slaves are prone that they like to be married, and obviously this depends case by case. But generally, was it like a positive thing? Like, did they want their slaves to reproduce, or did they normally want to keep them as healthy and working as possible? Obviously, this is you know case by case. But in um, general, I feel like what's the general idea? Reproduction and having babies was a big deal because um, that was essentially money and income. Um, a few cases of slave owners having preferences of female slaves to then produce and have babies with the express intent and planning of then when they got a little bit older, they would then be sold for cash. And like that was the plan that they had for them. Um, Even feed lots. Yes, <laughs> which is a horrific, but also B, they probably would have known all that the entire time, um, which is also horrifying to think about that um, if you did carry this child to full term, um, they wouldn't be yours. Well, I mean, get that. You talked a lot about the language of like, white people, white ladies, like, I mean, trying to avoid talking about being pregnant, but if we look, but, and I know it's like, 
too, but like, um, right, the language that white people are using to talk about slave women's labor or potential reproductive ability is all from livestock. Yeah, right? it's all about breeding. <laughs> there's there's no distinction in the way they're talking about like black women and the way they're talking about cows. Well, that's interesting because you think about the language of barren, that's also agricultural. Yeah. A lot of farm references. <laughs> yeah, and I took back a long way. Over 90% of Americans looked up. So, it was a thing to do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, you did touch on like everything, but um, do you see anything like the instructions about um, Things that they would do that they thought like would determine if they had a girl or a boy. I know there's some like good wife's tail type things that maybe they if yeah, like if they thought they did this or if they started to find the same it was more like underlying work. Is there anything like any mention of that? Not that I Red, and I know historically we think of always like a preference for boys, which is true to some extent, but kind of like what Dr. Naramore uh, brought up is that it was advantageous for you to have both a good equal number of boys and girls intermixed at different times um, to sort of like fulfill the gender roles um, of society of like your eldest son went off with dad to help him farm the earliest and the first. And then all the other younger boys would sort of like follow after them in chronological order. But the same goes for the girls of like, their job is to help with whatever mom needs around the house. Um, but then if you get that sort of uneven balance or uneven age balance, like if you have a disruption in your cycle of or like several infant deaths in a row and now you have a big gap of your oldest children and now your youngest is two months old and your oldest girl who is your only girl who's like, like 10 or 11 she's now the only person who can help you with all the various chores and works of around the house which is quite an extensive and exhaustive list and doing the laundry um is a lot of work. Like it's just having kids for labor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but also like society, but mostly labor. And to expand on the country, you don't outpace British growth. Yeah, you know? it's for the country. You gotta be a good Republican family and mother to your children. Early America. <laughs> We haven't gone very far, have we? As we didn't talk about anything recent, but I'm glad we could, like, stuck to the program. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anything, you guys should give yourself a round of applause for not taking the easy bait. <laughs> well, we could. We could. Okay. We'll be here all night. Also, discuss it. Thank you.